online, ladies and gentlemen, I bid you a warm welcome. At this time, we commence with some prayers. So I call on Mrs. Charmaine Louis Justin, Deputy Permanent Secretary, to lead us in prayers. Good evening all, may I invite all Catholics to sign in themselves in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we come here before you today, Lord Jesus, to this very important lecture on cannabis, very timely indeed. We ask that you anoint each and every one of us in this room. We ask that you also anoint those who are watching us virtually, Lord Jesus, joining us virtually. We ask that you continue um, to anoint the professor so that his deliv what he would deliver, Lord Jesus, would be, would be beneficial to us here today and as a country as we try to develop the regulations towards the whole cannabis regime. We ask that you guide the discussions taking place today. You help the questions that have been um, that will be asked today to be directed so that it can lead Lord Jesus um, to us advancing that whole uh, medical cannabis regime. We ask this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, DPS. At this point, we will have some welcome remarks by Dr. Sharon Belma-George. Dr. Belma-George is the Chief Medical Officer of St. Lucia. Thank you very much, Madam Chairperson. Good evening to all. I recognize Honorable Emma Hippolyte the Minister of Commerce, Manufacturing, Business Development, Cooperatives, and Consumer Affairs, the Deputy Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Commerce, Mrs. Charmaine Justin, Dr. Gerald Thompson, the CEO of the Medicinal Cannabis Authority of St. Vincent, Mr. Dylan Norbert Inglis, the Legal Counsel of the Ministry of Commerce, our health team, we know that we have quite a few persons here to have the discussion with us, and we have over 100 also on Zoom and also on YouTube. So good evening and a warm welcome to you. For us in the Ministry of Health, we have been very pleased to be working along with the Ministry of Commerce on the Medicinal Cannabis Bill. And as you are aware, for us in the Ministry of Health, evidence-based data is extremely important. We look at our local health situation where NCDs continue to be over 82%, the cause of death within the country. And our recent STEP survey, our behavior risk factor survey, has highlighted where some of the modifiable risk behaviors are. So of concern to us, um, alcohol use and abuse has been on the increase. We see it in younger age groups tobacco use as well, where we noted over 65% of, the, of the, the population from our survey reported smoking um, daily. Also overweight and obesity, over 65% of our population, raised blood pressure, and also raised blood glucose. One of the things which we have appreciated quite a bit, especially with Mr. Norbert English, who worked closely with our team, was ensuring that there was open, honest dialogue with the various stakeholders. And today is another example of ensuring that there is stakeholder and discussion as we move forward with the medicinal cannabis bill. What we continue to advocate for at the level of the Ministry of Health is to ensure that we use the data that is available and we ensure that our policies also reflect evidence-based data. Now that there is research that shows the medicinal properties of cannabis, in particular Marinol and Canasol, which has been approved by the FDA, after appropriate and effective studies have been effected, we have to ensure that whatever products are used 
are used with market authorization to ensure quality and standardization. We also have to ensure that whatever manufacturing of products are done locally, they must have strict standards to ensure quality and also to accurately determine the concentration of drugs that are present. We also want to ensure that whatever mode is used, it ensures dose standardization as well. Of some of the strengths which the Ministry of Health advocates for, for um, within the bill is ensuring that whatever is prescribed is from a registered medical practitioner and that whatever is available is through a duly authorized pharmacy. We also appreciate the fact that the ministry took the time out to review the implementation in similar jurisdictions and documented the lessons learned in the region to ensure that whatever is being proposed in St. Lucia, it's done as efficient as possible, learning from others and other jurisdictions where such legislation was implemented. One of the very important points which at the level of the Ministry of Health, because you would understand, we have a mandate for health and safety of the population. We have a mandate that is very pr protective um, given the health burden that we are already managing in country, as I indicated, uh, the issues of NCDs and the, the, the modifiable risk behaviors that we note and we continue to see through our various surveys, we have to ensure that whatever measures we implement, all of the safety nets are also in place to support to ensure whatever we do is done with the best possible outcomes. One of the gaps which we note is the lack of data on current use. The last uh, on current cannabis use, the last report that I've been able to get my hand on is the OAS CCAD report of 2016, which showed that over 25% of students in the age range, 13 to 17 years, used cannabis, and that is this is eight years ago. And Saint Lucia was the third highest use within the Caribbean. So, this is very outdated. There is need for new data. Um, to show the real use. And I think we need to be open and honest um, when it comes to use. Cannabis, I think way back, when it was seen as used by Rastafarians or persons on the block, this is not in, in 2024 in St. Lucia. Every strata of society, every profession, um, it's a lot more widely used than, than, than is openly admitted. So there is definitely a need for, for data and whatever we implement, must reflect the reality, it must reflect the culture of what's happening in country. We want whatever we do, it must also be realistic. We have to ensure that with the implementation, we have the capacity to, to monitor, to evaluate, and the capacity to regulate. There's also the need for a capacity enforcement given our already limitations with our police force. And for us in the Ministry of Health, when it comes to drug use and misuse, we have a more protective layer. It's not our concern to put anybody in prison. We are not about that. For us, somebody who has an addictive um, issue, our slant is about getting care and bringing them back to the best of health. That is where we are focused. Um, on. So if you review the bill, it calls for a lot of processes and procedures from growing to transporting to prescribing. We have to ensure that those measures are adequately put in place to be able to regulate properly what we are about to implement. Of concerns for us, and I it's, it's one of the issues I have whenever we speak about cannabis, that comparison with alcohol. Alcohol is not better, and I'm not going to, I think it's a little hypocritical to say that we have alcohol readily available. It should not be readily available. It should not be readily available to minors. We see the issues. We get it in our health facilities, the end products of alcohol use and abuse, and even in younger age groups. So we note that we've not been able to regulate well alcohol use. 
even among our very um, young persons. And also, um, for example, we've, we've, implement, we've passed the smoke-free space route legislation for indoor and outdoor spaces, that amendment to the Public Health um, Act in 20, in 20, the amendment in 2019 and the regulation in 2020. And this is one of the areas that we've not been able to enforce with, with the change made in the, in the regulation. And from a health perspective, we see the outcomes of that. We see it in our ER. We see it in the levels of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, that we register at the hospitals and our healthcare facility. So I think it is extremely important as we implement, we ensure all of the various levels are in place to ensure that it is done efficiently. Two other things that I want to also add, we have to ensure with this that we have adequate public and patient education. The data and the research has shown the medicinal values of CBD, but we must not, um, we must not forget that the, the harmful effects of THC still exist. So it is, it is important that we utilize the beneficial parts of the plant, but also safeguard against the parts that are, that are still harmful. The other aspect which we definitely need to strengthen on is our mental health and social support services, especially in relation to the youth. So we have to ensure that we have adequate information going out to the public, but especially the younger age group, we have to ensure we have the, the necessary social services in place to ensure we safeguard against them and we protect them at all costs. Um, at this point, we, we are very pleased for the level of consultation and collaboration that we have done with the Ministry of Commerce on implementation. So we just hope that all of the necessary measures are put in place to ensure that this is done as safely as possible, to ensure we get the beneficial aspects that are there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Belma George. At this point, we will have the presentation on medicinal cannabis and its applications. This presentation will be done by Dr. Gerald Thompson. And as I indicated earlier, sorry, Dr. Thompson is the chief executive officer of the Medicinal Cannabis Authority of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. He is also a specialist in allergy, immunology, and infectious disease. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Gerald Thompson. Uh, pleasant good evening to everyone. Um, Honorable Minister, it's a pleasure. And the audience here and all those who are in um, cyberspace, it's certainly wonderful. Um, I must say I am not new to St. Lucia. Um, as you know, I'm a, a medical doctor. I'm actually a microbiologist by profession. And I um, did internal medicine I went on to do infectious diseases, the master's in public health uh, in New York, Columbia University. And then I went into private practice. Um, I went into private practice at the core of what was the HIV epidemic. And there I learned a great deal. Now let me say I found, I, I saw a a Vincentian lass and I got a little connected minister and I moved back to St. Vincent in the Grenadines, leaving New York and um, I caught a bug, a political bug and went into politics where I became the minister of telecommunication, science, technology and industry. At the time we were setting up Ectel I became chairman of Ectel on a number of occasions and I was president of CTU and um, 
you know, I, I left the politics but became um, a special advisor to the prime minister dealing with troubleshooting things, the airport, and he asked me to look at cannabis like English, and I basically have been there for the last four years dealing with this. And so it's with that particular background that I, I come to you. Now, um, let me make sure I have all the things. Okay, right. Let me start off with the subject of pain, pain. Today in this modern era, we have a number of things to help relieve pain. But I, I, I'm a student of medical anthropology. And when you go back in history, you start to understand that throughout the ages, people had to use all sorts of different remedies in terms of relieving their pain. We know there were wars and battle, people were wounded. A farmer, a thousand years ago, who fell down and sprained an ankle, what did they do? Did they take aspirin and some ibuprofen? No. Aspirin was only discovered in 1893, just a matter of 120 plus years ago. Ibuprofen, Advil, Motrin, all those things we know. 1961, just a matter of 60 something years ago, we started to get ibuprofen. And it's been really only over the last number of years, the last 15, 20 years, we've started seeing a lot of the other potent uh, medication. But one medication being around for a long time is opium. Opium. And this is the whole history of opium and the opium wars in China, it's fascinating. That's not what this topic is going to be about. But let me say, the opium poppy, the seeds, if you really extract the stuff from inside the seeds, you're going to find two important, about three or four important substances, the alkaloids, one of them being morphine and one being codeine. One being morphine and one being codeine from the poppy seeds. And sometime later, somebody found out that if you boiled the um, opium, you could create heroin. You understand? And we now know of black heroin, gray and white. White heroin was from Asia, the Asian heroin, pure stuff. Black heroin was a crude mix-up and so forth. So if you were taking black heroin, and so, but sorry about the racial connotations to it, but if you were taking black heroin and somehow you found a dose, somebody gave you a dose of white heroin, pure heroin, you take, if you take the same dose of the white heroin, you're going to overdose. You understand? And we then found a way of making synthetic opioids. And in the, my last few years working in the United States, I can tell you, I wrote a ton of fentanyl. Patients would come in. The drug reps came and said, the fentanyl, synthetic Opiate, don't worry, we'll fix you up. It's good stuff. And I wrote a ton of it before I left the United States to return to the Caribbean. We need to find five, six years later the fentanyl epidemic. And now 106,000 people die of fentanyl overdose every single year in the United States from synthetic opium. I used to, there's a form of fentanyl called duragesic patches. So take it and give the patient to slap it on. They have to take that off on the market because of the addictive nature of these particular type of things. And I could go on to other things, Valium, Xanax, all this. In Europe, the greatest cause of death, of overdose death, is coming from Valium, street Valium, street Xanax. And... I have some comments on that in terms of how we look at that. For me, 
as an infectious disease specialist. In the, in the 90s, in the early 90s, um, I had a number of HIV patients. I had a lot of them. New York. My area of study was HIV in the elderly. I published a paper of 60 patients of persons over the age of 60 with HIV. The men, businessmen, white men, would drive down into Newark, pick up prostitutes, have sex, and then return home. Then we started finding their wives and them coming down with HIV. And I, I published this in an ICAC, uh, you know, 19, um, that would be 1980, 1989. I don't want to say, how, give you the idea how old I am and so, you know. But I remember with my patients, one patient came to me. He was a lawyer and he was losing weight. And he said, Doc, do you know, this is 1990, that in New York State, they're allowing us to use cannabis in order to smoke, in order to keep our weight up and, and, and put us. I never heard of that before. <laughs> you know? I thought he was strictly, so I called my lawyer. My lawyer said, yes, you know. He knew about it because he was a lawyer. And of course, I must admit this, the type of insurance he had, you know, it wasn't something that I was going to reject. But he said, I have a couple of friends. And he brought a friend the next week for the same thing. And they had the same insurance. And, you know, I, I got to tell you, the reimbursement was good. But I left to go down the Caribbean. And when I came back, there was a letter on my desk from the federal government saying I must not prescribe any cannabis, it's illegal, so on, so on, so on, so on. I, said, I started looking around to see if cameras were there, how did they know, you know? What it was at the time was that they had just passed the third international treaty convention and they had sent letters out to every physician in the United States. So I received one too. It wasn't that they'd caught me in any way writing letters. But the fascinating thing was that I saw these patients put back on their weight. I wasn't really writing the letters. They had their own network and they were putting back on their weight. Their appetite was good. I used to give these patients anabolic steroids, something called megase so that it could stimulate their appetite because we're losing weight. I was part of a group, we went to Kenya. We were trying to use alpha interferon as one of the alternatives to AZT in the treatment of AIDS. And there, people were coming in thin like a stick. In, in, in that area, they called AIDS Slim's disease. And again, you know, it was fascinating how for those patients with the experience now, the use of cannabis, it stimulated their appetite and they were able to put on weight. So apart from the cachexia and so that comes with HIV, here was something that wasn't treating the HIV, but overriding the anorexic effect of the HIV the inflammatory anorexic effect, and they started really putting on weight. So I wanted to see that experience. So I, even with that, I was not sold on cannabis. I must tell you, I got my own little prejudices about cannabis and so forth. But it was only until 1995. I had to attend a CME lecture, and the person who was going to give the lecture was Dr. Raphael Moshalam, the father of cannabis. 
at the time I hadn't realized the significance, but I'm there and I'm there, I'm not there. You know how you attend the lecture, you're supposed to be there, you want to go somewhere else, and so. And this lecture was about, he had discovered a new system in our body, the endocannabinoid system. And my mouth just dropped because I couldn't explain what was going on with marijuana and, and weight gain and so. But here, he was presenting something that was going to try to explain that whole process in cannabis. In those days, because of the various laws, it was impossible to conduct real research, double blind studies, that scientific studies that you want. You could conduct studies, but all the studies were oriented towards proving that cannabis was bad. I did my stint a couple of months at NIH and so forth. Right near in Maryland, there's a center called NIDA, right? It's the National Center of Drug Abuse for the United States. Any cannabis that's cut down in Texas or Maine or anywhere, they would ship it off to NIDA, they store it. And anybody who wants to do research has to apply to NIDA to get cannabis from them to do the research. You can't grow your own and do research. You've got to get it from NIDA and you have to sign off that you've got this amount and so forth. But I know some of the stuff has been there for five years, six years, and it's all, all, the, all the terpenes and all this kind of stuff has evaporated and so <laughs> And whatever studies were, were being done really had some questions. But here was this Dr. Mushalam with a new story. Next. Oh. Right, let's see if I get this right. Now, we all should know by now, and I really hate to repeat that, internationally, there are three drug conventions. Three international treaties. St. Lucia is a signatory. St. Vincent is a signatory. All the countries of the world, I believe, are signatory. Maybe one or two. And the single convention of 1961, convention of 1971 on psychotropic drugs, and then the 1988 convention on trafficking of narcotic drugs. N means narcotic drugs, ND, and P, psychotropic drugs. There is then a division of schedules. Sometimes the schedules are labeled A, B, C, but this real schedule is a schedule one, and cannabis is in schedule one. But guess what? They created an extra schedule, schedule four, and they put cannabis inside that too. And schedule four was drugs that had no medical value, no medicinal value whatsoever. You should never use those. But cocaine and opium and all those other things was not in Schedule 4. You understand? Only cannabis and a couple of other things. And it meant that you should really stay. I mean, it was not just putting one nail, but putting a few nails and so forth to make sure nobody uses this stuff. And so, I want to say that um, in 2020, where we have number four there, cannabis on the World Health Organization recommendation was removed from Schedule 4. And the World Health Organization acknowledged that cannabis has medicinal value. Now, the World Health Organization also suggested that cannabis be moved from Schedule 1 to Schedule 3. But it was voted down by a very narrow margin at the CND of 26 to 24 votes. There, in the CND, there are 50-something countries there and so forth. Now, let me go on. Let me, I, I could fast track. and uh, This is just uh, an old slide to tell you that in St. Vincent, we legalized in our Medicine Cannabis Industry Act in 2018, 
and we made amendments to our Drug Prevention and Misuse Act, our Drug Trafficking Offense Act, our, uh, our Proceeds of Crime Act, so that they're all in line. It did not allow for recreational use. It allowed medical use, but as the single convention say, you must create a law first. You can't just say, well, we're doing it. You have to create a law, an act, pass it parliament, and you have to send it to the INCV. You understand? You have to send your act to the INCV. And you must set up an authority and you must license the various stakeholders. And these are all laid out in Article 23 of the Single Convention. It's all laid out. And your legal folks who I see there will know all about this and so forth. Yeah. Now, I'm going to go a little fast. Yeah. Now, I want to bring up this slide because I was just in Bolivia with Miss Mondesi and Miss Felix, yes. And I was making mention to this when I, I was asked to chair a panel there, to moderate a panel. And I have realized that this important milestone is not well known. In 2016, the UN had a special session on drugs. This was just around the time of the UN Development Goals, the, the, the Sustainable Development Goals. And they came up with seven themes. It says we want to continue with our theme of demand reduction, our theme of supply reduction, but we must make medications available to people. You see, in Gaza today, people's legs are being cut off without anesthesia. There are lots of places around the world, rural areas. They don't have aspirin. They don't have ibuprofen. They don't have Tylenol, you know? And they've been using all sorts of other medication for years. You understand? No. So, in that light green, they say there must be availability and access to various forms of treatment to medication. And that's why I'm sure your drug inspector always makes sure that the pharmaceutical process is you have drugs and you send it off to the INCB that these are the drugs we bring in. They want to know that you have access. Yes, sir? But they came up also and said there must be human rights. Human rights for patients who may have drug abuse. We must treat them, just like what you said, with human rights. The way we used to talk about the cocaine jumbie. Well, in St. Vincent we did. I don't know if that happened here. Or the crackhead. They were saying we have to, you know, destigmatize drug abuse and try and treat these people. Now, some people say, man, we should beat these people you know, with a stick so that they stop taking these drugs. But the UN has been advocating a much more humane, a human rights approach to drug treatment because the inhumane approach has not worked. They've also said that the human rights of small personal possession, somebody with a small personal possession, there's no need to criminalize them, to throw them in jail, to having a spliff. You understand? You could handle it in a different way, but decriminalize it, depenalize it. We've done that in St. Vincent. We're not putting people in jail because they have a small possession and so forth. You know what I mean? We're not doing that. In Singapore, a year and a half ago, someone was found to, they had it on their cell phone, They'd received a message and they'd agreed two pounds of cannabis. They were put to death. They were executed for two pounds of cannabis. And under the UN, they've come up with also the concept of Nelson Mandela rules. And one would have to read through the concept of UN gas to get all this, these concepts. 
cut the discrimination, cut the, 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 the stigmatization, decriminalization, and so forth. Now, this, some persons will, will feel all oh, this is wrong. It's the same way like a child. We, should, we shouldn't spare the rod, you know, with the child. Um, and, and so therefore, we should beat these drug abusers and so forth, you know, to get, it, get the drug use out of them. And that thinking, I'm sure, is going to be prevalent in some cultures and some persons. But I want to indicate that UN gas is critical and changed the way in which things. CCAD then adopted, had to adopt UN gas. For us in St. Vincent, see right down at the bottom there, they also promoted alternative development. We have a large number of traditional cultivators, and so we have had to adopt alternative development. We are, we are distributing a couple of hundred acres of land to farmers and so forth who are traditional cultivators, but we're also going to guide them in getting into some new crops. We're in the process, we're buying a tractor, we're getting tools, we're doing all sorts of things and so forth. You know, I say I'm buying a tractor, it's been, it's been, it's, it's, I, I, my, my colleague there, Tim Lubap, he's the man behind the finances and so forth, and I've had to, you know, I've had to push him, but uh, we get in the tractor. <laughs> all right, let me go to so I want to say that nationally, conflicts exist. And some conflict exist, and this is a very sensitive area that I've observed throughout the Caribbean, in terms of the units that deal with anti-drug policy and the units that are now emerging in relation to um, medicinal cannabis. So the MCAs and the CLAs, there isn't a coming together to really discuss the issues and how the functions of each entity could be carried out. Yeah. I think there's a little bit of boot in there. I know that's not the case in St. Lucia, right? Because I've spoken to some of the folks there in, in the field and I think they're doing a great job. But a question that I'd ask, is there a serious conflict? You know, does cannabis have medicinal benefits? Does it have it? If so, why so many benefits? You know, um, what is the extent of the benefits? Are they real? What is the evidence? And I think, you know, you've, you've asked some of those questions. Is there research which has been done scientifically? Well, can medical cannabis be an alternative to narcotic drugs, to the use of fentanyl, to the use of Valium and whooping the stuff that, you know, and how much stigma is involved in your views and perception and belief. I mean, these are some fundamental things. And so I'm always, in this the, the persons who are involved in anti-drug, and we've, we've come together, you know what I mean? We've been working together. And I want to encourage this throughout the Caribbean. And I would say that in terms of CCAD, which is the hemispheric entity, to some extent, by the end of this year, all of the islands from Jamaica to Trinidad would have done some legalization of cannabis, maybe except Dominica. Grenada is going forward, St. Lucia. I hope that uh, you, you, know, you all go forward, but uh, you know, there may be delays. Mister, there may be little speed bumps and so forth that takes place, but I, the impression I, I have is that you folks are on your way, you know? And the thing is that I, I want to bring up an issue, and let me, let me go on there, that, that I want to say, in Caribbean drug policy, what is the greatest threat and the likely development between now and 2030, or maybe by the end of this year. I threw this slide yesterday, and I, and I wanna bring this out. In 1961, Harry Anslinger, who was the head of the anti drug in the United States, the father of the, the war on drugs, said, marijuana is an addictive drug. He was testifying in Congress. 
and he said which produces insanity criminality and death and he said you smoke a joint and you're likely to kill your brother likely to kill your brother and that's the risk of committing homicide I, I imagine that sometimes that may occur but he was framing it in a way that's it and in those years they were primarily addressing people of color now last year the united states president joe biden so i think it's a good doing a good job you know he all asked he had asked his health and human services division to do a study they did a two-year study on cannabis i have read that study backwards. It's my job. I got to read it and read it and I've been in part of regional discussion, the national discussion on it. And it says some important things that we must acknowledge. A, cannabis has a potential for abuse less than drugs or other substances in schedule one and two. And it should be rescheduled to schedule three. That's what they said. They said cannabis has a currently accepted list of medical use in treatment in the United States. And of course, they went through all the various studies and so forth to compile to be able to make that statement. And, and in St. Vincent, I do not have the ability to repeat those studies. I can read those studies and maybe able to say, that's on Americans, would it be the same as Vincentians and so forth? And that, that's a valid point. But I don't have the ability to repeat those studies that would soak all my all the money. I won't be able to buy the tractor. You know what I mean? And abuse of cannabis may lead to moderate or low physical dependency or high psychological dependency. Acknowledgement of that. That's real. But it was what was done, and I think Seymour, you, you, you drew the point. For the first time, the health and human service was a, I kind of a, as I said in yellow, the far um, sorry. The, the, the Health and Human Service emphasized the importance of the 2018 Farm Bill in, it, in its scope, which had legalized CBD. They've legalized CBD. In St. Vincent, we can't stop people sending down CBD creams and so forth in barrels and so forth. The customs, they say, we, we give up. You know what I mean? <laughs> because it's legal in the United States. But number two, Health and Human Services' decision to focus attention on how the harms associated with cannabis abuse compared to those associated with alcohol. This pointed out it was night and day. Now here in the Caribbean, I know for St. Vincent, our Calypsonians, we celebrate rum. You understand? We sing about rum. We, we, we you know what I mean? It's a great thing. Now I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I see a couple of people looking at me, don't go there. You know what I mean? <laughs> but really, alcohol is profound in terms of it. And what we have to talk about, we talk about excess alcohol. Having a drink is not a problem. It's the excess alcohol that persons are taking that's causing the cirrhosis, the liver, and all the other issues, the links to cancer, and all them sort of things. But health and human, number three, health and human service emphasize the variability of the cannabis plant as a botanical, right? And in its heterogeneity and said, it doesn't need, need for some standards in terms of how it's, it's done. And also in terms of um, in various states. Do you know, I, I've been to Michigan, Florida, a, a number of states to see what their um, cannabis cultivation like. Mr. Mapp and I, we toured Canada, we toured New York, we, we, we met with a lot of people. and. You could see each state, because of states' rights, some states, they basically produce stuff, and all they check for is CBD and THC. Others, they check for bacteria, check for this, the different standards. But it's number five. That health and human services analysis was the recognition that the, of the relevant data supporting that Marinol and Sandros were in Schedule 3. Now, I want to tell you about three drugs. Epidiolex is CBD. 
made in the form of a pill. The price for a month of Epidiolex is 3,022 US dollars. In other words, 8,000 EC. The price of Marinol is 700 US dollars. You know, about, what's that, 14, 1,500 EC. Sandra's a little cheaper. It's only 300 US dollars. You understand? But about eight, 900 EC dollars a month. Those, those particular things may be considered as pharmaceutically made. And that's why the pharmaceutical industry would like also cannabis to go away so that persons can buy that. Some of the best drugs coming out with diabetes now, you know, say more. The cost of them are so high. The average man here in St. Lucia, and man and woman, can't afford those type of medication. You've got to stick with, your, with, 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 with the normal stuff. Um, and let me try and go quickly here. There's some wrong perceptions. CBD is medical and THC is recreational. That's false. THC is bad, a bad cannabinoid. CBD is a good cannabinoid. It's false. CBD is not psychoactive. That's false too. It's not intoxicating, but it's psychoactive. You understand? It certainly has some profound effects on the brain. That's good, positive. CBD is a good product, right? So it's not an intoxicant. However, from CBD in the United States, they are extracting um, THC is called Delta 9 THC. There's a loophole in the farm bill and they're extracting something called Delta 8 THC. It has about the same effect, more toxic, but they're selling that in the United States. Expect that to be coming to St. Lucia. They have Delta 10 and a whole set of other things. Unregulated cannabis. And then there is what I call CBG. This is a great product. Unlike the others, I left the space there. This is like the mother of cannabinoids. And we, we'll get into a little bit of that. Yeah, wanna... Okay. Uh, yes. So let's just go through. For those persons who don't already know, maybe three real type of strains. We put nose of the sativa, the indica, and ruderalis. And ruderalis is a strain that flowers in a very short space of time. But this is all phasing out now. There are combinations and hybrids and so forth. There have been some good land races. There's, in St. Vincent, we have a land race that comes out of Colombia. We also have a Jamaican land race. There's a special Jamaican land race that's excellent. But over the time, you know, they've changed and they've merged and it's hybrids now. But I want to say that we, the, the, the symbol of cannabis is the leaf. Because in the 70s and 80s, everyone thought that the leaf was the thing that had in the ingredients. But it's the flower bud. But the leaf does have in some ingredients, far lower, and also the root. In St. Vincent, some of the old ladies would boil the root to, for their asthma and for their chest stuff and so forth, and they swear by it. But there's still a little bit of stuff in the root that boiling it and heating it, there is release of, of the active compounds and, and that's how it works. You know? Now, if I were to take a close-up of a bud, it's kind of hairy on the surface if I look on the microscope. But it's not hairs, it's really something called trichomes. And it's full of oil, they're full of oil. All these trichomes. These trichomes are not ripe yet, it's when it starts to turn a little yellow on the microscope. And you know, we train our farmers to, to look with a magnifying glass to see exactly when, if you take it too early. It's like a mango, you gotta wait till the mango ripe. You know what I mean? And so, in terms of the trichomes, that's the best time to, to actually harvest. This is all important. You know? 
um, I'm losing seconds trying to move this. In St. Vincent, we are into tissue culture. This is where a great plant, we're able to take a slice of it and under sterile conditions, right? We're able to put it in some special agar and other substances with sugars and so forth and grow it. This is a seed at the bottom growing, the root coming out, but at the top there is tissue culture. And we're able to produce the same characteristic plant. It's, it, 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 it's not the same as cloning. Cloning is just as good, right? But tissue culture, the quantity, with tissue, with, with, with cloning, you have a mother plant and you have to pick off a certain amount. But you can't pick off too much or you'll kill the plant. You know what I mean? You pick off some and then you plant those little branches you've picked off, small branches. But with tissue culture, we take in very small amounts and, say, and we can freeze it. We can keep it for 10 years and so forth. And we haven't done it, but we're looking at some of our land races and so forth to make sure we preserve them and so forth, you know, for the future and, and, and things of that nature. Let me just go on. And here I want to get into the medical. When I was telling you about Dr. Mushalam and that 1995 lecture that made my mouth drop, I had gone to medical school, done specialty training, and heard about that in our bodies we have 11 systems. I was wondering, why, why 11? You know, why 11? And then he was telling us there was a 12th system. A 12th system. So you can imagine my shock. I mean, I'm, I'm into immunology. And he's telling me that all the time I've treated patients and so forth, I didn't know about it. And, so, and I regret that during those years, I lost patients that if I had the information, I might have been able to do something more with them. So everybody recognize all those systems. And what the endocannabinoid system entails, since 1995, I suppose that's probably why I was doing something. And I want to, this has a pointer, doesn't it? Huh? It's a pointer? Is it, huh? I'm not sure if it does, but. The system consists of receptors in our body. There are two types of receptors. Some that are in our brain and our nervous system and our spine. And other receptors that are also in the brain but they're also in our skin and in our immune system. They lie on top of some of our white blood cells, our immune cells, the lymphocytes, the macrophages, and so forth. And our body produces the, the, what that's up in the middle, D, these ligands called ananamide and 2AG. CB1, CB2 receptors are made predominantly from omega-3 fatty acid kind of thing. And the ligands, omega-6. But when they interact, they cause certain things. And then to break them down, there's some enzymes that are produced in the liver and all sorts of things. It's a complex thing. But the important thing, my use is that inside our body, are endocannabinoids and I don't know how the Lord how God made it that way but he produced a plant that had phytocannabinoids that can interact with the same receptors and so what do these what does the endocannabinoid system do let me step away here a minute. It's so important to understand. We know the heart controls the pumping of blood around our body. And we know our lungs breathing. But what's been controlling our sleep pattern? Our appetite? 
what controls our mood? Being in a bad mood, in a good mood, and so forth, a rotten mood. What controls some of the new functions? What controls our pain threshold? Sorry about that, right? Reproductivity and memory. Oh, I see. The, the, sorry about that, the, the folks, folks online. I just want to get a little closer to that just to point it out because I can't point it. And the point is that these are important functions that we have ignored. We have thought, well, they just happen. But there's a system that's dealing with it. Other systems interact with it too and contribute. It's not just the endocannabinoid system, but I want you to understand that. And then I'm introducing to a term, CECD. CECD. Sometimes when you would Google it, it would come up very nicely. CECD is clinical endocannabinoid deficiency. We've heard of insulin deficiency. We've heard of all kind of thyroid deficiency. Those endocannabinoids I was telling you about, ananamide, 2-AG, there can be some deficiency in them. Whether it's that you haven't been taking enough omega-3 fatty acids, or you haven't been taking, it's a complex issue that isn't a easily as simple as that. But there is deficiency in your, in your endocannabinoid system, as there could be a deficiency in your thyroid, deficiency in your pancreas, and things of that nature. And you can have how cannabis works. There can be deficiency. And we can talk about replacement with natural products, or we can go with some of the good expensive stuff, the Marinol and the Sandros, and there's other synthetic illegal stuff called spice and K2 that you don't really want. And you remember Bolivia? They were, you were talking about how spice and K2 is swamping places like Belgium and things like that. But what they've found is that clinical endocannabinoid is directly linked to FIM. FIM, something called FIM. Fibromyalgia is a type of pain. We don't know why we have the pain, you know? But it's a kind of a phantom pain. We just got pain. Everybody, you, you ever go to the doctor, the doctor asks you, I don't think you had an injury? No. If somebody hit you? No. I just feel pain. This, 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 is, this is fibromyalgia. Inflammatory bowel disorder and migraine. We link in a lot of migraine headaches to endocannabinoid deficiencies. And I'm going to leave you to, 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 to follow up on a lot of this stuff. Many of you would have heard predominantly about CBD and THC, the two big ones in white. But I am more interested in a couple of others. I'm interested in CBC and CBG. CBC is the tropical cannabinoid, found more in tropical cannabis, right? And... CBG is the mother of all cannabis and so forth. And these things in combination, they've been linked. The trials are going on in terms of treatment for cancer and other things like that. We're seeing some profound things. The studies have not been as extensive as CBD and THC. But we're now seeing the work being done. Especially now, as they've said, cannabis has medical benefits. The door is being opened up. Research is being done, right? It's no longer illegal to do research. You don't have to jump to hoops to get an application for research approved. And I could just go down. This is a busy slide. These are some of the benefits of some of these things. And it's amazing what's really happening out there in terms of the research. But I want to just want to focus on. We've come up with a mnemonic called AMP Minds. A-M-P-M-I-N-D-S. A-M-P, and this is a, a kind of a brief, a mnemonic to abbreviate what cannabis can be used for. And this is important. A, appetite. Anorexia, HIV weight loss, cachexia, the cachexia of cancer. People are wasting away. The, I, I, I'm told I could say this. The CMO of St. Vincent, her father-in-law, was 
um, one of our senior politicians. He developed prostate cancer. And he thought he'd beaten it, but it bounced back. And it went all to his spine. And he was in pain. Mr. Mapp and I had just traveled to Canada. And I came back. Mr. Mondes, I, I came back with a couple of vials of the stuff. You understand? And the customs did not prohibit me from bringing it in. And then the CMO, when the CMO calls, I says, what could we do? I heard this could be. And he was able to receive the medical cannabis and that helped relieve his pain. And he died with dignity. He died not with a grimace on his face. You know what I mean? And I, I just thought I'll mention it. But I just want to say anorexia. Then M for metabolism. Nausea and vomiting. That's what Marinol is used for. Predominantly for, for vomiting. You know? You pay 700 EC dollars for a month supply. Or you could use cannabis and so forth at a much cheaper rate. Um, but pain... Cancer pain. I mean, talk about cancer that is spread to the bone, right? Or chronic pain, or migraine, uh, you know, and arthritis, sickle cell disease. I used to have patients with sickle cell disease. We got to give them all sorts of opioid medication. They're addicted to the opioids. They could be replaced with cannabis instead. It doesn't have to be smoking. It could be what I have there on display. All droppers, oils, and so forth. And then mood. Do you realize the, the accurate figure is 4.5% of the global population suffers from depression. And for anxiety, it's 55 I'm talking about half a billion people. And hear what they say. It's predominantly women who suffer more from anxiety disorders. The studies have shown that I don't believe it, you know? I'm saying that to be diplomatic, you know? But the point I'm making there is that mood disorders is, is really profound. And then inflammation, inflammatory disorders, especially inflammatory bowel disorders I told you about just now with FIM, arthritis, inflammatory autoimmune disease, hepatitis, and the nerve damage. I'm talking about epilepsy. Everyone saw Sanjay Gupta and Charlotte's Web. Sanjay Gupta wasn't joking. The, the young lady benefited, and today people are benefiting from, from epilepsy and so forth, and seizures, Parkinson's disease. Now, some of these, they are less, the, the benefits are less than you would have for pain. And then sleep, insomnia. Sleep disorders affect, I have 30%, they affect 20%. I, I've said this, that means that uh, some six, seven persons here suffer from sleep disorders. You understand? I don't know who all suffer from sleep disorders and so forth. You know what I mean? But the point is that cannabis, as you, now the funny thing is that THC is best for sleep disorders and best for anorexia, nausea, but CBD is best for degenerative diseases, CNS, nerve damage. And a combination of CBD and THC may be good for immune reaction. Mood disorders is best to go with CBD. Yes, I am? And pain, you need a, sometimes a combination and what persons can tolerate. Some people can't tolerate the CAT. You could, the, on the CBD, and it isn't working because it really needs a bit of THC uh, combined with it. And this is a very important chart to show that overlap. And so, with dosing, we have, you could have THC only, you could have CBD only, or you could have equal amount. But we also have intermediate with a little bit more THC or a small amount of THC and so forth in, do, in those doses. This is our lab. 
a state-of-the-art lab in St. Vincent. We constructed. Minister, you would have seen it and visited it and so forth. And we're particularly proud of it and so because we realize that in order to be a player, for the Caribbean to be a player, we had to show we could produce quality product and test it. We can't guess. We can't look at it and say, this looks like good stuff. You know what I mean? And this is, you know, this is the same sort of stuff there, you know. So I do want to just touch on this a little bit. CB1 receptors in the nervous system. It's at the end of the nervous system. And I want you to look at CB2 receptors on the white blood cell, on the macrophage, on the immune system. Just to give you an idea of the impact. Why are they there? Are they just there just because for so? What's the reason? There's some important functional reasons for it. They're not there for no reason. Do we know everything about it? No. You understand? We know enough, but we don't know everything about it. And this was uh, uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the function in terms of stopping inflammation. The whole thing, CB2 receptors and so are so engaged in these things. And a lot of, lot of information. I want to touch on this, the brain. And I know there are other persons in the room. There's uh, um, this part of the brain. Do you see a, a, a jagged circle called, uh, can I take the? This is called the medulla oblongata. This is a part of the brain stem. It's a vital, all parts of the brain is, vi is vital. Are you getting it? And it controls your heart rate. It controls your respiratory rate. And it controls your ability to swallow, vomit, and so forth. If you become unconscious, the risk of aspirating this, your stomach content and it going down into your lungs is an important cause of death, whether after surgery or so on. But overdoses, when somebody takes an overdose of fentanyl, oxycodone, Percocet, all these things, Valium, cocaine, it will knock them out because it's affecting the other, these parts of the brain. But it also suppresses because their receptors for these opioids in the brainstem. So your respiratory rate starts to drop. Normally, your respiratory rate is 16 plus, it starts to drop. Your respiratory starts to drop to two. You breathe in two beats a minute. Or your heart rate starts to fall very, very low. We even stop because of the drugs you die from the overdose. Cannabis give you a euphoria, will probably put you to sleep, and I don't know in terms of how the Lord made things that way. There are hardly any receptors for cannabis in the brainstem. So the person who takes an overdose, which they're going to be, but their heart does not stop. Their respiratory rate does not drop to the degree that they don't breathe. And that is why in the literature, they've not found death, overdose death as a result of cannabis. Now, certainly, if somebody takes cannabis and they're high and they drive and they crash into three, four vehicles and kill themselves with other people, and that's wrong too. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the individual who takes an overdose. This is often disputed, but it's now really remarkably being repeated. You don't see. The, in the CARICOM report, they had a chart showing deaths reported from cannabis, whereas deaths reported from other drugs. And throughout the world, the 106,000 people who die of fentanyl from overdose it's because of this side of the equation. You know what I'm saying? Now, 
Let me. Cannabis use disorder. I think we have to respect this. There are a number of very important parameters. If a young person starts using cannabis very early, talking about before the age of 18, I'm talking about the age of 13, 14, and they're using it consistently, and they have a family history, you know, of a psychiatric disorder, psych um, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and the type of THC that they're taking, the, the type of cannabis taking is a high dose of THC, and we've been seeing a gradual increase in the potency of THC in cannabis. You know, a number of years ago, it used to be 10, 12, 14. Now we're seeing it 18, 20. I, I could tell you, truth, in St. Vincent, one of our companies developed a cannabis that was 31% THC, right? And we sat down with them and said, oh, we don't think this is that. They said, we're right. The company we are linking with in Switzerland has said they don't want anything over 25%. They don't want anything below 20, but they don't want anything over 25%. And they were able to reformulate, and we had to check on them. We tested 24.5% consistently. Interesting. But even that is too, is too high. You know what I mean? CBD, um, today, remarkably, CBD is being used in the treatment of alcohol use disorders. The number of persons who are taking CBD to get them off of their alcoholism and alcohol use disorder. Opioid use disorder, cocaine use disorder, CBD is used. CBD is considered to be neuroprotective. I think I have a slide here, but you know, the, this is a chart that talks about our pleasure centers. I know the doctor who's a psychologist would be, you know, the, the, these, these areas, I don't want to get into detail, the amygdala, the nucleus acumens, um, and so forth. These things are so important and explains to us why people are why people become addictive to chocolate, to sex, to alcohol, to gambling, to all sorts of things. It's, it's, it's the same sort of reason behind it, in addition to drugs. And, you know, it has to do a lot with the dopamine and all these sort of things and so on. It, that it doesn't allow me to go into the detail today. And the brain, the neurotransmitters, I tell you, the amount of stuff that's there, busy, busy slide. But just to tell you how complex this stuff is. Um, I, of course, want to end, I've been going long, sorry, that um, today it doesn't allow me to talk extensively about things. I haven't gone into a lot of detail about side effects. I should tell you, we should not drive using, it should not be taken during pregnancy, you know, and all these things will come out in their own due course and the slides I've taken out, you know, to limit the presentation in a particular way. But I had to put this one in. In November, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we are going to be holding um, a medicinal cannabis festival. It's called Cannabis SVG. The name is not that important, you know? November 1st to 3rd. But the whole thing is that we are going to be bringing people from the Caribbean and around the world to talk more intensively about a lot of the things I'm talking about. Cultivation and manufacture. How is it really done? How do you achieve the best standards? How does the Caribbean become a player, right? And we'll be having farm tours. We're going to see some of how some people are doing it, how they've set up already. 
and then we'll be talking about the legal justice and regulatory reforms you know what's happening should you shouldn't you what you do here and there and what's what's worked what hasn't worked from a regulatory point of view has 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 decriminalization work has depenalization all these sort of things and so and then the medical benefit so you know i'm hoping that a lot of people be coming to me it wouldn't necessarily be me but we're having some big names come in to talk a little bit more about some of the more finer details in relation to smoking and cancer. Smoking cannabis, I want to say a lot of some literature has come out that shows that not that smoking is safe, but it is. There were some articles put out talking about cannabis just the same as cigarettes or tobacco. And these articles have debunked that thinking to a great degree. But we are also going to be talking about the broader medicinal industry, you know, about other plants that have medicinal value, philocybin, and all these other things and so forth. And we are looking to have a traditional cultivator's village with an expo. I, I must admit, I think the Prime Minister in our law has the ability to declare that, you know, they a day where certain things could take place but we will have a consumption lounge and that it, it should be it should be good we we but the point of it is is the, is the educational aspect and the toes and if anybody wants to slip down to Beckway or climb I love to climb Las Ufre Volk you know why because I could see the pitons I could see St. Lucia you know and so, let me say with that, I think there may be a couple, but I'll, I'll stop there, and I'm hoping there might be a couple of questions and so. I know there's some areas I haven't gone into in great detail, but I thought that in terms of limiting the length, I didn't want to talk all night, you know, and so. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. I'm sure for many of you here, the information presented was insightful, educational. So we're ready for persons. If anybody has any questions, you raise your hand and we will have the mic taken across to you. Questions? Can you name any benefits of smoking marijuana? Thank you very much. I brought these along. This is a vape pen. And this is a dropper bottle. And I was hoping to also have brought in some capsules with oils and so forth. When somebody takes a capsule, it is swallowed, it goes into the stomach, it goes through the intestine, and then is absorbed and goes through the liver. Really, the liver makes changes to it, actually making it a little bit more potent. And then it enters into the bloodstream and then goes to the brain to have the effect. That takes one hour to take place. And so taking tablets or taking things orally is a slow process. However, it lasts a long time. And people have to know this because somebody could take a tablet, especially this happens with taking brownies and so forth. Now be careful with that. If you take a brownie and you're waiting for effect and no effect, you take another brownie, no effect, you take another brownie, you've taken three doses and then an hour later, the person is dancing on the table, you know? With a dropper, we recommend the person takes this and puts the dropper and put two drops under their tongue. These things are usually flavored with um, pineapple or mango or so, so that they taste actually good. But not taste so that you would drink it, you know what I mean? But that it's palatable. 
and that it takes close to about um, about about five to fifteen minutes for it to be absorbed. One of the most intensive blood complexes underneath your, your tongue. And so it absorbs that and takes it around, but it doesn't go through your liver, it goes straight to your brain. So 10 to 15 minutes. However, smoking is able to give you the impact within a matter of one minute to two minutes because it's absorbed through the lungs, through the pulmonary artery, and goes to your brain. So you see virtually almost like an immediate. It's not immediate, but you see the effect within a matter of one minute, two minutes. Similarly, vaping would give you the same type of thing. So it comes down to a process. It comes down to a process, sorry, whereby to use this device, it is discreet. Somebody could take it and put it in his pocket. I didn't tell you that the smell of, from cannabis doesn't come from THC or CBD. It comes from the terpenes that are in it. There's these other compounds called the terpenes, and I didn't want to go into detail with that. And you have pinene, you have all sorts of different enes that smell in a particular way. You see them in li lime, has limoline, right? And some cannabis products have it. I must tell you, in St. Vincent, the, some of the lab people, they've come up with some unique combinations of terpenes that said they haven't seen before in other places. But what I'm saying is that by vaping, you eliminate some of the smells and the odors. Of, so I could come here and go into the corner and vape, and nobody here would know that I have used it. Whereas if I went there and smoked, somebody, more astute people, I'm sure or everybody would say, oh, I could smell cannabis coming from somewhere. You know what I mean? But the price is obviously going to be different. And just like I mentioned Marinol, and I mentioned Epidiolex, nobody wants to pay. Her. Now, in St. Vincent, they started off with these things at about $100. And they've now dropped the price, about 50 and so forth. And they have re refill cartridge and so forth. But for, for, for someone else, they may want to use a small spliff in the quiet of their home, the privacy of their home, and there'll be no problem. In my view, there's no problem for that. So I've given you a long answer. The advantage of smoking is the immediate effect. So people with pain, they may take a capsule. They know they have long-term effect. But as they're out and about, the pain starts to come on. And if they try to take another tablet, how long will it take for the effect to see? What they could do is they could smoke or vape to get almost immediate effect in terms of reducing the pain. Smoking and vaping will only last for a short period of time. The most it would last for about an hour, hour and a half or so. But at least you then be able to go back to some of the other methods and so forth. So it's a combination, same like insulin. You know how, you know, the amount of insulin you take and when and all this sort of thing and so forth. Can I ask something again? Um, having been very active uh, as an advocate and people seen me, um, total strangers have come up to me and said, um, I had asthma when I was a young teenager and I smoked ganja and the asthma went away. And a good few people have told me that. Obviously, there are people who said that they use the tea or the leaves and the root. But obviously, this is anecdotal. And um, what do you think uh, these people, how, how did the smoke affect their asthma? Or are they just tripping and they, they just imagine that? Okay. Quickly, there's three things I've got to say about that. If cannabis is not grown properly, there can be a fungus called aspergillus that can develop on the fungus or on the cannabis. 
So in the lab, we test for aspergillus. Aspergillus, if you inhale it or you try to sell it, it can trigger um, asthma. You understand? Um, in terms of uh, one of the cannabinoids called CBN is excellent as a treatment, an alternative treatment for asthma. You understand? Now, I didn't put that as one of the benefits. I didn't put glaucoma. I didn't put a number of other things that people recognize. But um, in, in, in certain cultures and so forth, the cannabis is used positive. However, you are going to find some persons because of their hydration and so forth. And that, 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 I've, I've seen where persons are using other type of filters and things like that in order to reduce the amount of dust particles and so that may well help. But an individual who um, has um, asthma, if they're not using cannabis for asthma, they use something else, you know what I mean? They may well go to another method of using cannabis if they need it for some other purpose, pain, this, that, and the other, you know what I mean? And I, I know your question you, you may be getting at is if, if um, smoking cannabis will trigger asthma. I'm, say, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that the circumstances it will trigger asthma is if there's aspergillus in it and the smoking in itself should not induce asthma in somebody who doesn't have asthma. But somebody who has asthma has to be particularly careful and may choose to use some other method accordingly, you know, to that. But a lot of persons who will not have, have not really known that smoking cannabis will just induce asthma just if there's no underlying history of asthma. You understand? Can, 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 can I, um, that's not bad. Can I add to something to yeah, respond so to this question? So one of the things that also that we need to look at is the effect of cannabis on your stress response system. So asthma itself is known to be, in, in a lot of persons, a response to, to chronic stress, basically. And the effect of cannabis on the stress response system is that it, it kind of um, dulls it a bit. It, yes. And, and that's, that's one of the common effects we see in a lot of persons. Yes. So then a lot of persons will find that using cannabis or smoking cannabis mm -hmm. um, will result in a reduction in the asthma symptoms. Yeah. Because of that effect, the, the cortisol in the, in the body reduces, the anti-inflammatory anti effect reduces, and those persons will then respond, report that the, um, uh, and the you asthma know, I, goes I put up a slide there focusing on the anti-inflammatory response and so forth, but you're absolutely right. And so each individual may be slightly different, but one of the important things is that um, on use, we have a policy of saying, um, start low, go slow. Start low, go slow. And if anybody has anything, then you could switch to some other methodology and so forth. But I, I agree with exactly what you said there. And I, I wanted to add to what Dr. Gilead just said, that the chronic stress response yeah. is actually underlies or underpins a lot of the NCDs as well. And that's why you see some of the studies that point out that um, appropriate use of, of cannabis can actually help with some of those NCDs as well. We talk, you know, diabetes, hypertension, even cancers from the point of view of them being the, the stress yeah. response, um, long-term chronic stress response um, reaction. And the other, the other the place, well, <laughs> certain off? experience with um, o cannabis oil, not high THC, but low THC cannabis oil, with agitated dementia in old in older people in particular, it's it's amazing. It that has been a, that's be, there's an amazing response to that. Can I, can with I just small just a few drops. Yes, I can tell you my my father, in 2017, he passed away from dementia. We had not passed the act yet, and again, I mean I think people are gonna get the impression that I'm a I'm a illegal hound, but <laughs> he. he he took some products. 
And I found that, but it's all anecdotal in that particular sense, you know, and I saw some improvement. But in the area of Alzheimer's, now what we've been finding in the elderly, in St. Vincent, the elderly, in their little groups and so, church groups and so forth, they have been finding cannabis. In our data assessment, 50% of the persons who are getting prescription are female. And this has gone against the grain where you expect an 18-year-old, a 19, a 20-year-old come in because they want to get high. We're finding that. And the age group is running, the highest age group is running 25 to, to, to 40 years old with a high, high proportion to older, you know? Now, as I said, this is where the, the difficulty is. The older folks are saying, well, we're hearing on Facebook and so forth that cannabis is safe. We're here in America, in Canada, our friends in Canada and so forth are doing this and that and the other. And so it should be safe. And this is where the challenge comes to the anti-drug unit because the young people are hearing that too. And they're thinking that it is safe, and the studies are showing that um, young persons are thinking that there's an increased safety erosion. Now, the truth is, it's safer than what they had heard before. Does it make you kill your brother? Does it make you do all the... No, it doesn't do those things. But the education has to be there in relation to the young folks. Because in the same way we've been telling them, don't have sex, you know, or don't drink rum, you know. Does it surprise you as mothers and fathers you find out that your 14 year old is drinking, drinking alcohol? Eh? Does it surprise you? Or I, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say, say any other thing about that. But the point is that it's happening and they, they are astute. The students in college, they're getting stuff online they, the same way. The trend that Jamaica is legalized, this Antigua, this, there, that St. Lucia. Is a, so what impression is that? So there needs to be some countermeasures. But I think that you have to expect some, sir, some increase in the use among young persons. But that education has to still be in place. And don't be alarmed by the increase because it is what is going to take place. Because you're telling the 60-year-old, the 70-year-old, it's okay, it's fine. They've been hearing over the years that it's going to give you brain death and all this other stuff. And they're now believing that that's not the case. So I just want to say. So we have um, one question that's coming from a participant online. I'm good. So Lillian is asking if cannabis can be taken together with maintenance medication. Um, yes, uh, but you see here what? This is where, uh, uh, CMO, the doctors need to be trained. I haven't put up any slides on various things. CBD is metabolized through the liver to what's called a cytochrome P450 system. If I start talking about it, it's going to, you know, it's going to, everybody shut down. It's a, it's a mechanism. The doctors, I'm sure, would know what I'm talking about. And this happens with many medications, that it slows down the metabolism of those medications so that those medications stay around for a little longer in your blood. They don't get, um, they, they, they don't get expelled from the body as quickly. So by taking CBD, that does happen. It doesn't happen with THC. And that's why in the early days, they used to use high doses, big doses of CBD. Now everything is microdosing. But the point I'm making too, and I didn't put up the slide, is this concept of the entourage effect. The entourage effect. Whereby if you have THC and you have a little bit of CBD, the CBD with the THC is neuroprotective. You understand? And if you have CBD, you should have some THC with it because 
it has an enhanced effect. So where they have isolated CBD, and it's an isolate, pure CBD on its own, it does not have the same effect as if it was the natural form or what we call broad spectrum form or thing. Now that's going to be dif difficult because our tendency, and I, I, I went through this, is to have the pure stuff, the Marinol and the Sandos, which the big drug companies have isolated and put together and are selling for 700 but I'm not sure, it, I, I could never buy that, you know what I mean? And so the average person to have access I think, and we've found, and Dr. Emmanuel and so out of him has presented a number of papers to show that the cannabis in its natural form, all the flavonoids and other ingredients, I haven't started talking about stuff that's inside the cannabis yet, good stuff, the flavonoids, they are present and they would have a much more positive effect. So I just wanted just to mention that. Yeah, and just to add to what you're saying there, um, that, that entourage effect that you speak of, yeah maybe one of the effects that a lot of persons get from the, the sm from smoking the cannabis. Yes. And that's why a lot of persons may be reporting um, the, the effects of smoking marijuana as almost similar to, to the medicinal can cannabis that's being promoted now. Yeah. And, and I, I think that's why a lot of the, well, the um, well voices I want that we hear. Well, I want to say smoking in our jurisdiction, mm -hmm. yeah. smoking of cannabis is allowed and is part of the medicinal. So we're okay. not making a distinction between smoking of cannabis and this stuff. Yeah, this because that, that's, what, that's what he asked earlier on. So it's a matter of just choice. It's a matter of choice. And I, I didn't go into it. A new person, somebody who's a novice, naive to cannabis, you start low, go slow. But somebody like yourself, if you were to ever go on this, <laughs> we do we we could we could we could we could go straight for the we could go straight for the jugular. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's the point that we keep. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um thank you very much for your presentation. Oh um you've practically answered the question because yes. you talked about the various isolates that that, that that um have been researched over the last yes. twenty years or so. Yes, yes. C B D, C B N and the yes. other C B G yes. I think you said was a yes. giant of them yes. all. Um and now my question was going to be, do you see that as, as the sort of modality going forward that is going to be isolates or because in my mind uh, it should just be the natural bud that is available that should be used with all the, all the complex um, compounds that are there and available that fit with the cannabinoid or endocannabinoid system that we have. And I just wonder what your take was on that. Yes. Yes, you know, I. That's a very interesting question, and I want to say it's going to be a combination of both. And the reason why I'm saying that is I put up a chart and really skipped over it. I had a very busy chart with CBD, CBN, so forth, and the work is being done in relation to the combination of certain cannabinoids for like breast cancer to prevent relapse of breast cancer or in relation to certain other type of condition. The information is not all in. Preliminary information, but the way we study things is that you could do, you, you, you do a study, then you've got to do double blind control study, you know, you know what I'm saying? And in the past, you couldn't do those studies. It was illegal to do those studies. So you're now finding there's a catching up and some of these studies will take five, 10 years. But in relation to much of the conditions that I have said, the average condition, the arthritis pain, the migraines and so forth, all these other things, you can use the natural product in those settings. When it comes to f the future, we are also going to see the terpenes being used because they have medical value too, to a smaller degree, and the combination of terpenes. And so it, to some extent, there's natural products and there's product that we do have to 
research and engineer but we don't want to over engineer it but we do want to see in terms in terms of what it could do to certain diseases that may not be on my list right so the answer is yes and no natural stuff is good for what i've mentioned to you and from an age point of view you will find that somebody who is taking it who's 80 something years old or that may not necessarily want to smoke i can't accept that they may want to take it in a different form right whereas somebody who's 40 something may in the quiet of their and the privacy of their home should not be denied that fundamental human right as was expressed in UN gas and from 2020 November 2020 they said cannabis is no longer in schedule 4 it is okay to use it in those particular type of setting now that hasn't filtered through yet that hasn't filtered through yet but it will do you know what I mean and you know you know it, in, in that Bolivian conflict, La Paz declaration that we, you heard about UN gas, UN gas, UN gas all the time. You know what I mean? And I mentioned it when I went up on stage. So I, 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 I want to say in the future, we are going to see the use of some engineered products, not necessarily Marinol and Sandros, but you're going to see isolates coming together, you know, and um, it's, it's happening. It's happening in the Caribbean. I don't want to. I don't want to let out what's happening in St. Vincent and so forth, you know, but, you know. Well, thank you very much for that. Yeah. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this will be our last question. I just, um, I just wondered if the cannab uh, medicinal cannabis industry in the region would evolve to the point where, let's say, I go to a doctor and he prescribes a cannabis product, let's say, to take 500 milligrams three times a day for seven days, and then I go to a pharmacy have that um, prescription filled out, then the insurance then reimburses me for the cost of, of, the, of the actual cannabis product. Yes. In Germany, the medical insurance system does that. Unfortunately, nowhere else in the world has adopted that. And to an extent, it's largely because um, the money that's collected has to be banked and the um the, the pharmacies the dispensaries and other things like that the, the 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 federal restriction like if you want to pay with your credit card and all that sort of stuff you may be prohibited from paying with your credit card you know what i mean because those are visa mastercard they're federally operated so i don't think it may necessarily happen although I'm expecting this year the United States to reschedule cannabis from Schedule 1 to Schedule 3. In 2020, it was voted down. But the United States finds a way that where no one else can do it, they can. You understand? They will do it. And I've seen the papers how they plan to do it, but they're going to do it. And I mean, I like to think I'm a Democrat. So Joe Biden is going to also do it because, you know, it'll be a, it'll be a plus for, for the elections, you know. But I, I think that what we should expect is a f the job of law enforcement and the job of the, anti, of the drug prevention unit. Your job, you're going to have a tough job. Because stuff is going to be coming down in barrels from the United States. Because right now, things can't go on a plane. Things can't come on, a, on, on, on boat, can't be shipped out. Can't go from New Jersey to New York. You can't come across the George Washington Bridge with cannabis. You can't go from one state to the other. But then when they do that with Schedule 3, Schedule 1 drugs is different from Schedule 3 drug. Yes, Sam? I could take my Valium and I could go from New Jersey to, I don't have to declare it at the border of New Jersey I got value. Can I take it across to New Jersey or New York? I, you know what I mean? But when they reschedule, that's going to happen. And you're going to see people shipping it down in barrels. You see people coming to a cruise ship. You see people. That's why it, it's, in, it's impo important to establish a regime now that, you know, you have good product here. You could get it here. 
and so forth. You know what I mean? And um, just, ex just expect that. But I also feel, I'm hoping that at some stage, if you have a card or anything like that, and you come to St. Vincent, that your card is also going to be honored. And you can get your product for your migraines or for your arthritis. And so in St. Vincent, without having to pay uh, uh, any sort of additional amounts and so forth. I think we did that, you know, in terms of um, OECS, I mean, OECS product could come in St. Lucia and you get a car, you could bring it over to St. Vincent. It should be the same thing, you know what I mean? So, and, and visitors, uh, so we might have the same thing. So I'm looking, I'm looking, for, I'm looking forward to this. But I'm saying for, for my, my journey, it's been a little long. I, I, I regret that in the 90s that I was so short-sighted. I, I, I wrote those guys a letter. Okay, go, go, go and get that. You know what I mean? You can get your, your car. It wasn't a prescription. I, 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 I didn't, had no objection to it. But maybe I, I saw a lot of patients who wasted away. Right? And I may not have promoted the cannabis. And it's only after I found out there was an endocannabinoid system. And you know, cats, dogs, all of them, they have endocannabinoid systems too. You know? So the pet industry, pets should not get THC. They can get CBD. But there's a whole big a horse, cattle, all them kind of thing. I'm telling you, it's a big industry. You know? And you know, by, I mean, I've been thinking about I wonder if I should get back into practice. You know what I mean? I mean, I have a radio program every Wednesday night in St. Vincent. But you know what? Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe, maybe I'm just a little too aged to do that. But I think, I, think I, 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 re, I regret not having pushed it a lot more. Yes, um, blessed love, um, give thanks, um, blessed evening, honorable minister, honorable Dr. Thompson, give thanks for the lovely presentation, CMO, blessed. So what you're saying basically is that the Rastafari was right. The Rastafari, <laughs> I've said this, matter of fact, in Bolivia, I said the Rastafari was right. You know, I, I, I said this. The Rastafari, Rastafari were damn right. <laughs> 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 All right, so basically it took us about, let's say, to be discreet, yes. at least a 70 years to catch up yes. with the vision of what the Rastafari was propagating from 70 years ago. I, and I wonder how. I wonder, how did you all know that? <laughs> what, what kind of scientific studies did you all do? And so was, it, was it just experience and so forth? Or was it foresight or, or blessings or what? The, the, the endocannabinoid <laughs> system. <laughs> so basically what I'm saying is that there are many other synthesis that the foresight of the Rastafari community has been proven to have some great scientific validity. There are plenty of aspects or the ways that the herb is being utilized by the Rastafari community that we have not even thought of to, to dive into with profound scientific analysis. Yeah. Because so it provides us with an opportunity to say, well, if, if what they were saying 70 years ago was right, so what happens when the smoke goes through the water and comes out? Yeah. What's the difference between that aspect and probably a whole plant extract now that they call, how do they call it, the, the what effect? The entourage. And the entourage effect. Yeah. That's a beautiful name. Yes. But we, we used to call it synergy, or I and I, oneness. Yes. So there is also a strong spiritual component, which is critical in what we call, even in integrative healthcare now. Yes. Whereby uh, a, a doctor is, is urged to recognize the, the religious leanings of the client, yeah. um, the, the, the specific culture, and even, as you pointed out, the utilization of herbal medicines or, or, or other med medicines. So, if the Rastafari have been using it for that spiritual aspect of it, it also provides us an opportunity for lots of research and development. Mm -hmm. And it is something that 
Um, just to point out something with, with what Brother Pancho was saying, if the smoking, yeah. even the original Rastafari principle don't promote the smoking of cannabis through a paper. Yeah. The, the original principle is that the smoke has to go through water to get cooled off and cleaned off. And, mm -hmm. and when you look at the science, they call it the chalice. Mm -hmm. and, and then they call it the bong. Yeah. Right? So I think that there is a lot of, of hope that as brothers and sisters, we could still collaborate and look to see how we could create a, mm. a good system that even the mm. Rastafari would also have the right to prescribe, not just the pharmacists. Yes, interesting. Blessed. Interesting. Yes, eh, interesting stuff. You know, um, we, yeah. we, we face the same thing in, in St. Vincent in terms of the naturopaths and the herbalists. They're not on the list of saying that's why we're looking to include them but i think some of these things will take some time during the pandemic we all learned about turmeric and ginger right and gin and turmeric has in this curcumin and so forth in it that that's really excellent can it cure covid no but in terms of it was able to help significantly and after the pandemic now we just forgot forget about all that there are these benefits because your CMO has told you that throughout the Caribbean, the study in, 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 in the um, 2007 Heads of Government report, it said that five islands in the Caribbean had the highest levels of NCDs and so forth in the whole of Latin America and the Caribbean. You understand? We, in our step study and so for 2015, we haven't been able to repeat ours. The money involved, I'm really happy to see you were able to repeat yours the other day. Data is important, but the money, to, it's like doing a census. And you know how much money has to be spent on a census? It's tough. And, but the information that comes out is remarkable. But what it's showing is that diabetes, hypertension, and all that, it's also showing that mental illness, drug abuse, is a form of NCD. Yes, sir? You know what I mean? It should be looked at in that, but it would be classified as that. But I believe that our diets have so changed. Our diets have been so westernized. And the stuff we're eating, that to some extent, we do have to start to embrace the concepts of the turmeric and gingers and the other things that will go. We now know fiber, soluble fiber. I, 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 didn't, I was going to put up a slide. 70% of your immune system lies inside your gut. 70% along something called the prior's patches. Because the gut is the gateway for germs to enter into your body. And when you don't eat the right types of fiber, the bacteria in your gut, do you know what they feed on? they feed on fiber. And when you don't feed them, they start to eat away at your mucous membrane. They start to release certain toxins that get into your blood, go to your brain, and that's one of the whole concept of Alzheimer's and dementia. You've been hearing on show and reading about the microbiome and all these other things. I'm putting it to you that the Caribbean, and I know that the CMOs and so forth have been really looking at this and on top of that. But we have to... I, I know the food tastes good. I know the food tastes good. We're over time. But I am hoping that we can have a major shift in our attitude, not just to cannabis, but also to food and NCDs. And St. Lucia remains... I mean, the, the guys, I don't know about you, but the ladies here at St. Lucia look, 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 always looking good. You know? <laughs> Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Good night. Thank you, Dr. Thompson, and thank you, participants, for your questions. Our final presentation will be on the cannabis regime and where are we now, and this will be done by Mr. Dylan Norbert Inglis. Mr. Inglis is the senior legal officer within the Ministry of Commerce, Manufacturing, Business Development.
con <laughs> cooperatives and consumer affairs. He was the chairperson of the Can Cannabis Bill Steering Committee, and he's currently a member of the Board for the Regulated Substance Authority. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Dylan Norbert Inglis. Good evening, everyone. We were scheduled to have ended at 9 p.m. this evening. Um, being being St. Lucian, we like to be hospitable, so I've, I've extended quite a bit of hosp hospitality to my, my, um, my dear friend from St. Vincent. Uh, I think what he was discussing was quite valuable, so we, we allowed him some latitude. Um, nevertheless, it, it's now quarter past nine, so I'm going to have to accelerate my presentation somewhat to, to get you on at a, at a fair hour. Um, so there, there are a few points that I think are really integral to this discussion, um, more so leaning at the, the medicinal industry and how it's going to play out within St. Lucia. So the, the background to the cannabis industry here is one that we know. So we well appreciate that the Drug Prevention and Misuse Act is a piece of legislation on our books. And even the nomenclature of that Drugs Prevention of Misuse Act um, was one that we have to, to look at in a certain context. But going beyond that, 2014, there was a CARICOM um, report that spoke to the legalization of cannabis in the islands in the Caribbean. That report actually spoke to the legalization of recreational cannabis. Um, and that report was the basis of the legalization throughout many of the islands in the region. Um, in 2019, the government um, caused a commission uh, on cannabis to look into legalization here. And that was the start of our journey in legalization. So first steps in 2021, we knew that there was the changing of the Drugs Prevention of Misuse Act by way of amendment, and that amendment allowed for a simple possession, what we refer to as possession simpliciter, of 30 grams of cannabis. There was also a statutory instrument, and I'm going a little quickly because I understand the, the time constraints. So there was a, a statutory instrument which allowed for cultivation of four plants, and there was also an amendment to the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act that allowed for the expunging of records for persons who had less than 30 grams for nonviolent cannabis offenses. Uh, last year, we had the enactment of the Regulated Substances Act, and that created the Regulated Substances Authority, or the RSA. So the RSA is the entity which will be responsible for the cannabis regime in St. Lucia. And it's referred to as the Regulated Substance Authority because unlike the other jurisdictions, it will not only be dealing with cannabis. There is an intention for, not just an intention, but within the legislation, it speaks to the authority having the ability to look into a number of substances. Um, as it stands now, we already have started looking into radioactive sources um, as another substance that the authority will be responsible for based on an international obligation. So I've already spoken about what some of the other regulated substances are. There is also an intention and interest in looking at some other substances. Alcohol may be one of the substances that may fall under the RSA. Um, toxic chemicals and pesticides is being examined as a possible um, area for the RSA to have responsibility. Um, we also have a few others that the board of the RSA will be considering in short order. So the status of the RSA. So the, having passed the legislation in November, the Cabinet of Ministers has now um, appointed a board of directors, and just two days ago, um, we had the gazetting of the members of that board. So we expect the first meeting of that board to take place within the coming weeks, um, and they will, at that point in time, be able to give, um, by way of resolution, a motion and initiate the, the um, matters surrounding the RSA. Right, what we really need to understand here this evening. What does a regulated cannabis industry in St. Lucia look like? So the industry and the development will allow for cultivation, processing, commercial trading, use of cannabis and cannabis products for medicinal, industrial, and scientific research purposes only. The regime will require licenses for cultivation, transportation, wholesale, distribution, manufacturing, dispensing, exportation, importation, research, and testing on cannabis and cannabis products being used for practitioner prescribed medicinal class two and self-prescribed therapeutic class one. And I'll touch on that a little bit later, as well as industrial and scientific research. Uh, Dr. Thompson spoke earlier about our requirements based on our international, ob international obligations to ensure that every stage of the process is licensed. 
So we have that requirement and we're going to make sure that our legislation speaks to the requirement for a license for every stage of the commercial process. So as I said earlier, the RSC will be responsible for the regime and in being responsible for the regime, it will be responsible for issuing all of these licenses. So, let's go back one slide. Cultivators will have the opportunity to cultivate under um, an approved license, cannabis for industrial or medicinal purposes, and we'll touch on the difference in, in industrial and medicinal cannabis shortly. Unless otherwise permitted, all cannabis cultivated shall be sold to a central entity. Now, this is something that is specific to St. Lucia. When we looked at our, our, the, the other jurisdictions and what they had done for the industry that they had, we felt that there was a need for a bespoke approach in St. Lucia. So the central trading entity, or the CTE, as it's referred to, is something akin to your Banana Growers Association of, of yesteryear. It, it seeks to ensure that the players in the industry will be guaranteed a place within it. So if you have companies that come in from overseas who want to get into cultivation, that's fine. If they want to get into cultivation, they will be compelled essentially to sell to the CT unless they have a fully vertically integrated model. So that is the hope and intention of incorporating the CTE in the process in our jurisdiction. So medicinal versus industrial. In St. Lucia, if the cannabis is being consumed by a human being, it's medicinal cannabis. So regardless as to how it is being consumed, if a human being is going to consume it, it's going to be medicinal. If it is not going to be consumed by a human being, it can be considered industrial. Class one versus class two. So class one medicinal cannabis, as I alluded to earlier, will be available without a prescription from a class one dispensary. Class two medicinal cannabis will require a prescription from a duly certified medical practitioner, and I'll touch on that in a second, and will only be available at a class two dispensary, which must be a licensed pharmacy. The Minister of Health, on the advice of the Medicinal Cannabis Advisory Board, which is created within the act, uh, shall determine what product shall be class one and class two based on the THC within the product or other cannabinoids. The central trading entity, which I spoke to earlier, will be allowed to serve as the conduit between the two, and they will be responsible for, uh, serve as a mechanism for encouraging manufacturers to obtain products from a traditional cultivator, and um, they will also be responsible for monitoring quality. So the burning question, pun intended. How do you determine, or what is going to determine what class one is versus what class two is? We cannot say at this point. There is within the legislation, the advisory council. That advisory council is going to comprise a number of experts um, from the medical field and otherwise who will guide the Minister of Health as to what should be the delineating factor between class one and class two. And because it is in the regulations or by way of statutory instrument, it can be changed and amended accordingly. So it does not require the act of parliament for an amendment. If it is that the, uh, the advisory council says that we think it should be this amount of THC within a THC product, if it should be a CBN product which has this amount of CBN in a finished product, and we're looking at finished products, eh, then they would recommend to the minister who then can issue an, a statutory instrument indicating that all products with less than this amount of THC will be a class one product. And obviously if it is a class one product, then it can be sold in a class one dispensary. If it is above that threshold, then it must be sold in a class two dispensary, which will require a prescription from a doctor, and which, which can only be sold at a class two dispensary, which I said earlier, must be a pharmacy. Right, so we, we spoke earlier on, on the distinguishing factor. Points worth stressing. Individual possession of more than 30 grams of cannabis will not be permitted without an authorization. So under the status quo, you are allowed to have 30 grams of cannabis. That is, is to remain the case with the new piece of legislation. However, you will not be permitted to have more than 30 grams on your person. Possession of class two medicinal cannabis without a prescription or without authorization will not be permitted. So again, 
if you have class one cannabis, that is fine. If you have class two cannabis, you should have only have obtained access to class two cannabis by way of a prescription. So if you don't have a prescription, that would not be authorized and that would not be permitted. Cultivation of more than four plants in a household will not be permitted without a license for cultivation. And smoking or other consumption of cannabis or cannabis products in a public place will not be permitted. The sale of cannabis to minors will not be permitted. Now on this point, it is of note. A doctor can prescribe cannabis to any person. It is a medicine. So unlike some of the jurisdictions where we understand that there is a restriction on cannabis use of, of, of 18, our regime does not recognize that restriction for class two cannabis. If it is that the doctor is of the view with their medical training that a child of three years of age requires a product that has cannabis, they can prescribe that cannabis product to someone of any age. If it is that is a class one cannabis product where the individual does not require going to a doctor, that person can access class one cannabis only if they are over the age of 21. If they are under the age of 21, they can still access class one cannabis, but they will require a prescription for it. So another burning question, what of the Rastafarian community? So under the legislation, the Rastafarian community, they have been given certain carve outs and certain caveats within the legislation. If it is that they wish to cultivate, there is a special license in the regime that is referred to as a traditional cultivator's license. That license is supposed to only be given to individuals who are traditional cultivators. The, uh, a religious organization, and we didn't specify a Rastafarian organization, but a religious organization can apply for a traditional cultivator's license and be treated as an individual who would have been part and parcel of the industry prior to the legalized regime. And with regard to the traditional cultivators, the persons and religious organizations who apply for these licenses will be issued them under less costly and less onerous parameters. So what we're trying to engender is a, a culture where the companies who want to get involved in cannabis, the licensing regime for them may be more costly than the regime for your traditional cultivators so that you are encouraging them as processors to engage the traditional cultivators in the processing, in the cultivation rather, and purchase the cannabis for their processing. So what of the current crop? Because we're all aware that St. Lucia has quite a bit of crop. An amnesty is being provided within the bill and it provides for a process for the application, the approval of it, and certain immunities and rights for the persons pursuant to that amnesty. So with the bill as it, as, it is, as it is currently drafted, somebody can apply for that amnesty, it will go to a board, the board can approve that amnesty, and if that amnesty is in place, there are certain requirements of you to submit some of your, your, your products so it can be tested, to ensure that you meet certain parameters, that you do not grow fresh crop, but the crop that you have will not be cut down and burnt, etc. If it meets the certain criteria, it can be funneled into the legitimate system through that amnesty. How much longer do we have to wait? And, and I looked at the minister when I asked that question. Again, the legislation has undergone an iterative process which has allowed for refining and improvement of the concepts and processes in the bill. Um, expert consultants have been engaged to develop regulations to support the bill. These regulations have been received and the review is ongoing. Um, it is expected that the draft will be ready for public comment in the coming weeks. And even the regulations that we received um, after reviewing them, we realized that quite a bit of the information in these regulations had to be incorporated in the bill itself uh, because the drafting unit th felt that some of the suggestions in the regulations were, were, uh, went to the core of the actual bill, so they're now being incorporated. And that's why we have not been able to release the bill as yet. We had intended to do so about a week ago. So these are some of the regulations that have been developed. So limits and residues of contaminants, the public and religious consumption, medicinal cultivation, uh, medicinal manufacturing, transportation, import and export, um, central trading regulations, packaging and labeling, uh, the medicinal authorization, and just a point on medicinal authorization, within this regime, all medical doctors as it stands now will not be permitted to issue a prescription for cannabis. 
there will be a requirement for these medical doctors to receive some certification. We're still in discussions with the board of the RSA and with the, the individuals in the Ministry of Health as to what that qualification will look like. But we want to ensure that we, anybody who's going to be prescribing cannabis knows full well what it is that they're doing. And we accept, and I think all of us have accept that very little medical training is given in the current tutelage of persons in, in medicine. So we want to ensure that anybody who's going to get involved in prescribing cannabis would have gone through whether it be some course, some formal training, and been certified to allow for them to prescribe. So there are regulations which speak to, to, to that. There's the access and use regulations, class one and class two dispensaries. We discussed the fact that there are two different dispensaries. Um, the research regulations, advertising and marketing, testing and laboratories, your test kits and your levies. So what now? Um, I tried to have this wrapped up within 15 minutes and I'm just two minutes over. Um, we look out for the bill and the regulations which we hope to release within the coming weeks. Uh, the public engagement, which we hope will, will be fruitful and will be as, as well attended as this one is this evening. Um, please review, digest, question, critique. We welcome it all. Um, any suggestions that you make will be taken into account, whether or not you see it forming part of the legislation. Trust me when I say we go through a painstaking process of considering every single recommendation and suggestion, no matter how outlandish it may seem. And finally, um, if you'd like to receive a copy of the bill, if you have any questions, concerns, comments, queries, uh, we have an email address we have put up here. You can send an email to us here. When the bill is ready for dissemination, we will send it to anybody who has requested one in the, by, by way of email. Uh, or any questions that you have, we will review. We will ensure that at our board meetings that due regard is given to all the comments and concerns by the populace. Uh, if there is nothing further with which I may be of assistance at the two minutes past the, the, the hour I had suggested I would have been, uh, I will take now a few questions. There should be a mic to the back. Okay, good evening. I know you went through it really quickly, so maybe yes. I missed um, what I'm about to ask, but I need clarification. Um, I heard a lot about laboratory testing. Mm -hmm. I know there's quality assurance. Mm -hmm. You also spoke about the amnesty, about testing the crop. What is in place in, with this regime as it relates to testing? Um, is it just that um, maybe private companies who have license, license, sorry, licenses for um, testing or has the government, is there something that the government is putting in place or the authority for testing, quality assurance, um, determining soil type, zoning, where, you know, just general guidance as it relates to testing of the cannabis product? Okay, so we, we referred earlier to the regulations and we have specific regulations for testing. So in these regulations, which we hope to release soon, it speaks to what are the requirements for a laboratory that's going to be testing cannabis, uh, the licensing for that lab, and a lot of the other parameters. So as soon as we release that, you should be in a better position. Okay, so if we are ready to go on live, we're ready to, this is happening, and there's no company with a private lab, that's what mm -hmm. I'm saying, what is in place are we not going to test? Will we have to source an outside lab? Will we use it like, will be used in a lab on island? What is going to happen? Well, we have already had discussions with um, some of the powers that be with regard to our testing regime. We've looked at what Barbados is doing. We know that there is excess capacity at certain labs in the region. Um, so we're looking at what the situation will be at the time that we roll out and we would make use of the different options that are available. May I just suggest that we do have a lab that we probably can use? Yeah. Our agriculture uh, lab? <laughs> yeah, we, we, we know that. So, you see, just there, a there, are, there, are some, there are some issues with the use of, of, of some of these labs. So, depending on the jurisdiction that you intend to export to, if you want to export, some, of these, juris, some of these jurisdictions require that you have specific a cannabis lab. specific a cannabis lab. lab. So, so, we can have some testing done here, mm -hmm. but if you but want to satisfy whichever demand, jurisdiction yes. you're going to be sending to, there may be a requirement for a cannabis specific, specific I noticed you all have that in St. Vincent, yes, right? Yes, a Vincent specific lab. lab. Correct. Any other questions? Oh, I 
ministers. Um, you raised the issue of class one and class two, and uh, you indicated something about uh, if you have a class one, you should be 21 yes. and above. So how we'll have our own people monitoring this, but how do we differentiate? What is required to differentiate between a class one and a class two? In, in terms of access to it? Well, no. Um, for example, somebody is walking around, somebody age 18, mm -hmm. as what in the end would be a class one. Okay. So drug. within the, so, the. Yeah, the process of identifying that, that class one versus so a class two. So within the legislation and the regulations, there are specific requirements for packaging. So we had packaging and label regulations. So the packaging would be able to easily identify a class one versus a class two product. So class one products are always finished products. There is no breaking bulk for class one products. When it comes to a dispensary, it must be a finished product. So similar to this? This, is a, a, this would be something akin to a class one product. A class two product is being dispensed at a pharmacy. It can't be, well, not can't be, but in most cases, it wouldn't be a finished product. Very often, the pharmacy would have to do what's called breaking bulk. So if you have lots of pills and a person is prescribed 10 pills, you're actually breaking bulk to give them 10 pills. So in that case, the pharmacy is going to be responsible for them to properly identify that product so that it can be easily identified. So that's why in, in our regulations as they are currently drafted, the responsibility for how you identify a product falls on different persons. So in the case of the class one product, the packaging and labeling responsibilities fall on the producer, well, whoever is doing manufacturing. When it comes to the class two product, it would fall on the pharmacy. I just want to ask uh, one question. Very frequent use of uh, cannabis raises the risk of strokes and heart attacks. For that, what is the response for that? That's a very recent study which, uh, from American Heart Association. The, the study shows for? that increased use of cannabis mm -hmm. raises the risk of heart attacks and stroke. Mm -hmm. Just want the answer from the doctor. Okay. 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 You know, about a, a okay, come to the mic. Ago, I have seen that particular come to the, the mic, doctor. Yes, a, a couple of months ago, I had seen that particular article. Um, I, you know, in a similar way, there have been articles suggesting that there has been. Uh, or is likely to be an increased incident of cancer. Uh, I'm celebrating my 40th year as a physician. And remarkably, I mean, the question was asked if the arrest is arrest. I haven't seen a big surge in persons in the Rastafari faith coming down with cancer. You understand? I don't know if the, if the epidemiologists have noticed any particular thing like that. We are often talking about um, a medical regime and an illegal regime. I have no doubt in my mind that currently there are persons who are using cannabis illegally. I want to also warn you, um, in Bolivia, we had lectures, we had a lecture from the drugs are in Belgium, that Belgium is experiencing a massive surge in crack cocaine, and we are seeing increases in, in the Caribbean. I'm saying this because sometimes the cannabis is a vehicle, it's adulterated, and in terms of what else persons are putting in it, I want to make an appeal, and we're doing this in St. Vincent to the Rastafari. If this is a sacred herb, we have to do everything we can to make sure it is not adulterated. There's no doubt that with cocaine and so forth, there's been an incident. I've gotten an impression that in terms of that particular study, there's been no differentiation as regards what exactly might have been in the product. You understand what I'm saying? 
and that uh, the, the, the declaration that it ha has come under some review and some, some scrutiny as regards whether that is the case. But we could well check and see here if in the Caribbean, uh, we haven't, I don't think we've really noticed that in the Caribbean, if there's been an increased incidence of heart attack directly due as a result of cannabis or an increase in stroke, what we're seeing is an increase in stroke and heart attacks coming from diabetes, hypertension, stress, and all those other factors that we have to deal with. But I, I think in that particular, there was a lot of questions as regards the makeup of the uh, uh, cannabis itself, exactly the marijuana, what, what exactly is it, what it might have had in it, because in some other places, they are adulterating it with methamphetamine, with this, with that, the other, and all sorts of things. And I want to, I'm, I'm, I think we got to launch a crusade that if cannabis is something sacred to the Caribbean, we got to keep it that way. And it shouldn't be adulterated in, in any way. That would get your CMO very unhappy, I'm sure. You know? <laughs> um, Dylan, so under the new regime, 30 grams is still decriminalized. So. Mm -hmm. Somebody that, that is not class one, not class two, just 30 grams of, the, the of, of cannabis is decriminal. That's, that, will, that will remain. Mm -hmm. What about substances like hashish? Mm -hmm. um, what, is, what will happen? Okay, so the, the current parameters speak to cannabis and cannabis products. So within the definition for cannabis, it speaks to any product that would have included cannabis as a cannabis product. Um, similar to other products that you would have had, uh, any other matter would have been that matter, so it, it's a similar treatment. So the hashish would have been treated like a cannabis product. Yes, good night. Um, you mentioned breaking bulk. Mm -hmm. In that regard, you meant that in a pharmacy, the raw cannabis product may be bulk and the mm. pharmacist breaks it down based on the request from the patient. Mm -hmm. But typically what is done is that the products are packaged in small amounts, in mm -hmm. so our experience. So there isn't any tampering, any, any um, adjustment to the cannabis by the pharmacist in mm -hmm. so. And that, that, that may be the case here as well but you do not know for a fact what will be prescribed and how it will be prescribed. So Typically, so it's, it's, it's packaged like in three grams, small amounts. So it, there, there's but, but even that we can't, we can't say. So, so even if the, it, how it is packaged is the, the prerogative of the processor. Yes. How it is prescribed is the prerogative of the doctor. So if the doctor says that I want to give you one gram as opposed to three, when all of the processors have put it in three, then the processors now have to change to put it in one. If it is that you, you have to import some products that may not be on your market initially. So we, are, we have to acknowledge the fact that if we start a regime tomorrow, though we have, quite, we have a plethora of cannabis products on island, we're well away. They may not necessarily have been tested and been scrutinized to a level where they can be sold as pharmaceutical products. Okay. We may have to, in the initial stages, even with the grimace I'm going to get from certain sectors, we may have to import some of our products. That's, that's the reality. If it is that we are importing some of the, the products that we can see on the table here today, if these products come in, and this may have 30 capsules in it, and a medical doctor says, I want to prescribe 10 capsules for you to use over the next three days, you're breaking bulk. So, so understanding that it may only be the 30 and luckily for the pharmacist there's no need for us to break bulk and i can just sell you the, the entire thing but if the doctor says 10 we wanted to ensure that our legislation allowed for the pharmacist to do that because you can't take that power away from the pharmacist understand and no i was just giving you our experience yes, i understand I understand, the I understand. so, well, so we're hoping that there's no need for it and yeah. the pharmacist will have the easy job of just giving finished product that's the right, hope right. but if it is and we recognize that that's a possibility. We do not want a situation where our legislation didn't speak to it. And the pharmacist is now saying, well, what do I do? Because yeah. the prescription says he's supposed to only get four pills. And I only have them like the, I'm not supposed to. So we, we said, if that's in fact the case, you still need to deal with it in this way. My, my second point is the issue of someone under 18 being prescribed cannabis. 
I know you mentioned it, but does your law provide for a caregiver? Yes. Because in the prescription, a caregiver must be the person who really is responsible for the, the prescriptions and so forth. So it does provide a caregiver, and does your law provide for that caregiver to have a medicinal cannabis card? Yes. So we do have caregivers in our regime, but a caregiver would have been responsible for the administration because you would not obviously trust the child of three and four to administer the product to yeah. themselves. So, but the, the prescription will still be coming from the medical practitioner. They will say that the child must take X, Y, and Z, and they will yes. give that prescription to the caregiver. You right. will get the card as a caregiver, and I believe under our legislation, unless it is your child, you as a caregiver, you can have no more than three or four persons that you are responsible for. If it is in fact your child, then you can be responsible I, for all I of just, your children. I just wanted to note that, so that it's important that you make that point in your presentation too, as you okay. present that an under 18 is being prescribed cannabis under the supervision of a caregiver. That's very important. Okay. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. We'll take one last question. Yes, just a question. Um, I notice a lot of control in your legislation, and what I note as well is that we are dealing with a new generation of people who have a totally different mindset to us and who do not like to be controlled. Mm -hmm. So my question is not if but when those that new generation begins to fight back against that control how do we adjust our regulations and our need for control to accommodate our youth um you see i think the issue that we face is one where we are operating in a space that we have been in the beautiful thing about life is as you evolve things change. The only thing that is constant is change. I have had the benefit of, of being in the Canadian system for some time. And I have had the opportunity to see how things were when they first legalized five years ago. Incidentally, it's five years since they legalized. Where you went into a dispensary and you went for weed. And where you go to a dispensary now in Toronto and you're walking and people ask, what effect are you looking for? And that shows a very quick shift from I want weed to what effect are you looking for? I'd like to sleep. Oh, you need CBN then. That's the kind of conversation that's now taking place within five years. So they're no longer looking for cannabis. They're looking for a CBN THC one to one. That's the kind of conversation these people are having. They're walking and saying, what's CBJ? Because the packaging and the labeling now specifies this is CBJ, this is CBN, this is CBD, this is... And there are now entire pamphlets when you walk in on THCA, on THC, T, THCV, thing, but it has opened the minds of these persons. The hope is that the young persons who are not yet initiated in cannabis will grow up in a time and space where cannabis is different to the cannabis that we know of. So I'm hoping that the person who's three, four, and five, who when they get to an age of consuming cannabis, is not thinking like the person who was forced to smoke it behind the school when they were younger. And I will not happen overnight. And we will have, as, as I joke with my, with my mother quite often, we will have the feeling like we're cutting our hair with graters for some time. That will happen. But with time, you will have a generation that will come to appreciate that, okay, I would like a certain effect on me, and this is a drug that I can take in this way to cause that effect. Not that I want weed. So we're trying to move away from that to a respect and reverence for this product, and that will happen with a regime that has to be flexible and not over-regulate, and has to also take into consideration that all of your regulations may not be able to be met in the beginning, but you need to have standards that you can ask persons to, to, to aim for. So within the legislation, there also, uh, uh, there's authority for the RSA to allow for somebody not to meet the, all of the regulations for the first five years. So the RSA can say, if you have a cultivation license, you are required to have cameras, fencing, this, that. We understand that's quite onerous. But the RSA has the ability to say, 
we will grant you a license to cultivate. We know you won't have cameras and fencing within the first year. We can waive your camera requirement for one year. We can waive it for up to five. And beyond five years, the minister can give you an additional two years to meet those standards. Because we understand that you want to have persons want to be part of the industry and not immediately believe that you're, you're cutting them off or removing them from having any access to it. Thank you. I'm sure it has been a long night for some of us here. <laughs> At this point, we would like to thank our presenters, Dr. Sharon Belmar George, the Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Gerald Thompson, the CEO of the Medicinal Cannabis Authority in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and Mr. Dylan Norbert English, the Senior Legal Officer from the Ministry of Commerce, Manufacturing, Business Development, Cooperatives, and Consumer Affairs. We would like to thank all participants here and those who are participating online via the Zoom platform. The Ministry of Commerce would also like to thank the Ministry of Health for its support, as well as the various interest groups and other stakeholders as we look forward to a mutually beneficial working relationship and as we work together to advance the medicinal cannabis in St. Lucia. I thank you and good night.